right into this thing like I'm someone who knows how to swim. All right. <laughs> All right, so we're going to get started with John 20, um, 21 to 22. I feel like, um, so you say it. 20, 21, 20. 22. Yeah, so like, so basically, where we at? <laughs> John 20, 21, 22. All right, um, and it reads, So Jesus said to them again, Peace to you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. Lord, speak. Speak, God. I'm praying, Lord, that it is not me who is heard. It is not my words. It is not my thoughts, God. But that you will speak in this moment. Because, God, you know the right thing to say. It was you who spoke light out of darkness, God. It is you who spoke for there to be heavens and the earth. It is you who spoke for there to be sky, for there to be water, for there to be land, for there to be bees. You speak and things move, things shift, things change, things cannot remain the same. So I'm asking God that you speak in this moment, oh Lord. Precious name pray. Amen. All right, so as we just read in John 20, uh, 21, 22, it speaks on how this is after the resurrection and Jesus is now coming to the disciples and the others who were with them at that moment. And, and he tells them, peace be with you. And he also says, as he said before, previous chapters, you know, as the father sends me, sent me, I now send you. So we have been sent, guys. Yeah. Um, and and that is something that's important because Jesus himself was sent. So what exactly does that mean to be sent? Of course, if you're sent, that means that there is a mission. That means that there is a purpose. Nobody sends anyone anywhere for no reason. Right? So what was the reason that Jesus was sent? Why did the Father send his son? Why did Jesus come? And um, and that is something that is important for us to, to know. And it's simple. It is so simple that Jesus is even, that's why he's given the name Jesus. You're right? Jesus came, he was sent for our salvation. Jesus means salvation. Jesus means God saves. Yeah. So in himself, and saying, when, when the angel told Mary that you will name this child Jesus, already the purpose is already being told to her at that point. Hey, his name, even his name will say what he's here for. Even his name will push forth the purpose as to why he came, which also lines up with what we see all the way in Genesis when he is promised to us. So here we know that Jesus came to save us. What he came to save us from, he came to save us from sin. He came to save us from death, not just from the sins that we committed, but sin itself. He came to save us from sin itself. And so while he was on earth, he understood this mission and he understood this goal and he never lost sight of that. Jesus never lost sight of what he was here to do. He never lost sight of who he was. All right, he knew, I am Jesus, I am God saves, I am salvation, I am here to bring forth salvation. I myself am salvation. Yeah, yeah. You know, so it's, it's not just I came to bring it, but I, I'm bringing myself who is salvation. And if we look at Luke 4 verses 18 to 19, we kind of get more of a breakdown of what that actually looks like. All right, so it says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. So in all this, Jesus is saying, this is why I've been sent. This is why I've been sent. And, and you, kind, you kind of ask, like, well, didn't you just tell me he was sent for salvation? Yes. Mm -hmm. All of these things are all things that he did to bring us salvation. It's all the same thing, just worded differently, just broken down a bit differently. To say he came to preach the gospel to the poor. It is not that he was walking around to homeless people telling them the good news. The poor is the poor in spirit. Yeah. Those who have been deprived. 
So, so the, the poor are the people who need Jesus. Yeah, yeah. So he came to preach the gospel to us. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs will be the kingdom of God. So he's, he's coming to preach the gospel to those people who have been deprived. So that is the way of giving life. I have been deprived of life. I have been deprived of life. And here Jesus comes to give me him, the good news. He came to heal the brokenhearted. Why? Because sin brought forth broken hearts. Sin brought forth heavy hearts. Sin brought forth sadness. Sin caused separation from the joy that we knew in relationship with God in the garden. So Jesus came to heal us from that. He came to proclaim liberty for the captives. Why? Because sin bounds us. Yeah, yeah. We were bounded by sin. We were bounded by death. Here he comes to give us life. In Galatians 3.22 it says that we are prisoners of sin. So when he came to set us free, he came to set us free from the chains, the jaws of sin and death. He came to recover sight to the blind. We were blind. We all came to this world spiritually blind, not able to see the light, not able to see him, not able to know him even. And so he came to remove the scales from our eyes that we may see Christ, that we may know Christ. He came to, to, uh, he came to set at liberty those who are oppressed. Why? Because sin oppresses us. Sin holds us. And he came to set us free. He came to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. It is the time of salvation. All of this is broken down, but at the end of the day, it all speaks on the same thing. Jesus came to give me life and to give me life more abundantly. Yes, yes. He came to save me from death. He came to save me from sin. He came to save me from the consequences of what happened when that fruit was eaten in the garden. It, it, Jesus, Jesus said in the garden, God tells the man, he tells Adam that you can eat from any tree, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you should not eat because the day you eat it, you will surely die. And the day they ate it, they died. And so Jesus came to bring life. With life came reconciliation with relationship with the Father. With life came uh, uh, sight. With life came life. With life came joy. With life came love. With life came peace. All of these things come with life. Life, it comes with freedom. And so here when he breaks that down to read this prophecy that was in Isaiah to say, this is speaking of me because I am the one who does these things. I am the one who can do these things. But even when Jesus was saying that, he was in the temple and he was teaching. But these things were not fulfilled just from teaching. Mm -hmm. The life of Jesus was not a life lived out of just teaching, but it was a life of serving. Because he said, I come into this world not to serve. I come not to serve, I come not to be served, but to serve. And all that is still salvation. He came to give you life. He came to set you free. He came to feed you. He came to reach out to you. All these things are services. Here he is, I did not come to be served, but I myself came to serve. And that's what we see that Jesus did. He left heaven put on flesh, came, uh, came to a virgin woman, lived life as a human being, being fully God, being fully human, going through all the trials, all the sorrows that come with being human, to live in community with us. All of this for salvation's sake. There was never an act that Jesus did that was outside of the reason why he came. He never lived outside of who he is. Every time he moved, regardless of what the move is, it was for the sake of salvation. Yes, yes. A, a lot of times we like to look at like, well, Jesus did this, and Jesus did that, and Jesus did this, and we like to take so many things out of context because we're not holding on to the reason as to why he did what he did. Yep. Why was he healing? Why was he feeding? Why did he change the water into wine? Why did he have communion? What? All of these things are all for the reason of salvation. Mm. All for salvation. Even the rough conversations to bring people to a place of repentance because repentance will bring forth you to have a relationship with God, will bring forth for you to have salvation. It all is for 
salvation. Everything is for salvation's sake. Go ahead in the chat, write out salvation's sake. Salvation for sake. salvation's sake. Salvation sake yes yes and so we see how jesus was moving and all of these movements were fueled by love it all was fueled by compassion but so many times we read and we'll see and jesus was moved by compassion and jesus was moved by compassion here we see that jesus came on earth and lived in community with people he was literally in community he came to to a person and to a woman, to a virgin woman, he's in a he's in a nation, he's in a tribe, he's in a specific people, he's from a specific uh, a city. People know him. He's Joseph of Nazareth. So there is there is a an identification with his town, yeah. with where he was raised. And even then, we see Jesus in community. Jesus hanging out with these people. Jesus eating with those people. Jesus spending a whole day with the multitudes of these people. Everything he did was all for salvation's sake. He's here spending entire days with people. Mm. To the point, he's like, they haven't eaten anything. I need to feed them. He's moved by compassion, seeing that these people are hungry. They were with me the whole day. I have to feed them. There, there are moments where disciples like, bro, it's getting late, and they need, to, they need to go back home. They need to eat, so let's send them off. And Jesus says, you feed them. Mm. Be moved by compassion. No, I can't let them stay like this. Let me feed them. Hearing beggars, hearing people cry out, Jesus, Jesus, yet he stops. People who we may look over because we got so used to them crying, so used to them shouting, so used to them being in a particular place, yet Jesus stopped and he had compassion and he moved and he healed the beggar. He healed those who were lame. He healed those who were blind. We're seeing how Jesus, how it speaks about in Luke 4, all these spiritual things that Jesus came to do, but we're also seeing how Jesus also doing them physically as well. That's good, yes. See, yes. before he even speaking of in, in, in John before he even speaks on how people are spiritually blind he healed the man who was blind from birth mm. something that has never been done how do you bring sight to eyes that have never been that have never seen before Jesus did that to show how there's there's your eyes your spiritual eyes that have been in darkness that have not seen I came to give sight to that as well Ooh. see so here Jesus is doing things physically that affects us spiritually yes, yes. so even when, when he healed the one the, the one man who was paralyzed and, and he and he said your sins are forgiven you and then they looked at him like who you think you are to forgive sins mm. and like just so you know that i have authority to forgive sin pick up pick up your mat and walk here jesus is doing physical things things that you cannot do yet he speaks into existence and it happens to let you know don't you dare limit me because which is harder to do to tell this man his sins are forgiven or for him to get up and walk and his sins being forgiven is a lot harder but we'll be living like we can't even get him to get up and walk but you know what just to show to you my authority and my power get up and walk and here jesus is doing these things and yet he sends us wow so we see the life that jesus has Okay, sending us, you sent us in the same manner. Jesus, what were you doing when you were here? You were moving for salvation's sake. But yet, you moving for salvation's sake, it was you moving in community. It was you moving and being aware of the people who are around you. It was you going from town to town. It was you not discriminating against certain people. It was, it was literally, you did all these things, but they all were for salvation's sake. So here we are now, church. Are you aware of your community? Are you aware of what's going on in your city? Do you know what's going on in your county? Do you know what's going on in your neighborhood? Are you aware of the situation of your neighbor? Because these things are important. Because how do we expect to move for salvation's sake or to move for Christ's sake when we are not even concerned with what is going on with that person right then and there? See, here's one thing that Jesus understood. He understood me feeding you spiritually is not something that is attractive to you when you are physically hungry. He understood that while you have these physical problems, while you are going through these problems you're seeing right now, that you're experiencing right now, you don't want to hear about anything that I have to say about your spiritual state right now. Because this is a permanent problem for you. This is what's real for you right now. You're hungry today. You don't know what you're going to eat today. Who, for me to step up and say that I am manna. I am the bread of life. You're hungry right now. Well, can I eat you now? 
can I eat you? You say you're the bread of life, but I'm hungry today. My stomach is growling as you are talking to me. Jesus understood, well, let, let me take care of these physical things. Let me show you that I care for what you're actually going through so that you know when I'm speaking to your spiritual things, it is from that same place of compassion. Because as we are moving and we are and we care to share uh, uh, the good news, it has to come from a place of love. It has to be fueled by compassion. Because compassion is going to make me see where you are now. Yeah, yeah. And me, me addressing where you are now physically allows me to address where you are now spiritually. And for a lot of us, there is this disconnection. No wonder it is such a struggle to share the gospel. So many times, I'm like, share the gospel, share the gospel. How do I share the gospel? I don't know how to share the gospel. When are you supposed to do it? Well, how does that look like? Well, all this because we're thinking, okay, so I just got to talk about, hey, Jesus died for you. Hey, Jesus did this, did that. And what if I tell you it is encompassing you living a life of love? It is encompassing you caring for your neighbor, in you loving your neighbor as yourself. And by that, there's no way that I'm saying that you don't actually share the story, the word, the life, the person of the gospel. But I'm saying in order for it to be palatable to people, there's some people you just got to love on first. Mm -hmm. I can't just step on somebody in the middle of the street and I see you're in need and go like, hey, Jesus loves you. Why should that person believe you? When you yourself see them in the state that they're in and you don't care for them. We need to understand that our physical realities are what builds the blueprint for our understanding of the spiritual. And, and this is what I mean by that. If I don't trust my earthly father, if I have an issue with, with trusting my earthly father, I have an issue with trusting God as father because my vision of father is perverted. So now the idea of assigning the title father to God is not a very good one. Wow. wow. So I, when things go wrong, I expect to be let down. I expect for things not to go my way. I expect not to be loved. I expect not to be provided for. I'm not trusting God with these things because I learned from a young age I cannot trust Father. That's good. So at that point, I will not trust God as my heavenly Father. Or we can look at how things are in the home when we, or, or, or even in school. When you do good, you are acknowledged, you get rewarded. That's when, pe that's when uh, adults like you. That's when they accept you. So, of course, now I'm raised on the mindset of works. I do good works. I get rewarded. I am shown love. I get hugs. This is when I am accepted. So, so now the idea of works are not what moves God. Now it confuses me because for me, whenever I need to accept this or something, I know that I have to do good works in yeah. order to be accepted by my parents, uh. by my teacher, by, by whoever. Or we can look at relationships with each other when there is a fallout to see how forgiveness is not given. To see how now you don't want anything to do with me anymore because I hurt you or because I did this. How you don't have grace for me. So now the idea and the concept that God forgives me, that I was forgiven ever since on the cross, that there is no, no sin that the blood of Jesus has not washed. I cannot think of that. I cannot fathom that because I have lived and I have seen what offenses have done. I have lived and I have seen how offenses are not forgiven, how they will forgive but not forget. I, 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 have, I, I live that. Me, myself, I experienced that. So the idea that God forgives and he doesn't hold grudges or that God forgives and he forgets my sins no more, I can't fathom that wow. because of how I have experienced life with people. And so when we realize our expressions of what we do in life affects how people view God, it should make us stop and think, how am I actually living? Wow. That's so because good. if we are living a life similar to God's life, because everything that Jesus did was for salvation's sake. So if I'm not living and everything I do is for Christ's 
sake. I need to be more aware of how I am living, how I am loving my neighbor. See, for, for some people, it, it's going to take you being kind to that person, for that person to know kindness does exist, for them to understand how kind the Father actually is. Yeah. So many people associate wrath with God and not the love of God, not the compassion of God, not the kindness of God. Why? Because we ourselves don't move in kindness. We ourselves don't move in love. So if we are his students, we are his disciples, and to be that is to follow in his footsteps, and these are the things we are projecting, and these are the things we are sharing, of course it's hard for people to fathom that God is actually love. Yeah. Yeah. Of course it's hard for that. And so even as we look at the world today, we can look at the United States, just this country that is on fire now, that is in darkness now. Church, where are you? Where is the hope that we are giving to this country? How are we living in this everyday life? Where is the justice that we are living out? Where is it? Because it is absent right now. Church, we have gone to a place where we are so passive, where we have been paralyzed, or we are puppet. It could be either one of those things. Either we are not moving, or we'll kind of move and then we'll pull back, or we will move accordingly to what this says or that says, or or what how the government wants us to move, or whatever it is. When we already have a king, there are so many places right now that the world needs the love of God and is waiting on us. We are the hands and we are the feet. Yeah, yeah. Social justice. I don't understand how there are churches, how there are pastors, how there are followers of Christ who are literally saying we will not get involved in social justice. How do we do that? Where they do that at? I'm trying to understand. I'm so confused. And you can have the argument, well, that's not the gospel. Social justice is not the gospel. Okay, fine, fine. Let's go with your argument. And I agree, social justice is not the gospel. But let's go with that. Let's go. Social justice is not the gospel. Okay, so as a result, you choose to pull back? Question. While it is not the gospel, do you believe that it is something the gospel can affect? It is one thing to believe it's not the gospel. It's something else to say the gospel has no room in social justice. That's not true. So if, if the church is saying there is a problem or there's a situation or there is a neighborhood or there is a community that the church should not get involved in, consequently what you're saying is this is something the gospel has no jurisdiction in. Wow. And how do we move and think that there are, there's, actually, there's actually issues or problems or things that the gospel has no just no jurisdiction in when everything affects every living human being. There is not a thing on earth that does not affect a soul. There is not a thing on earth that does not affect a person. So when we're looking at social injustice, for me to think that the gospel does not have room or the gospel is not able to penetrate that, oh, you are limiting the gospel. I don't know what you think the gospel is. Hey. Or, or we are looking at police reform. Yeah. Or you may look at this side and that side and be like, they are extremely, ex they, they are so extreme, you don't want to get involved in that or anything of that nature. Well, did you ever think that the gospel may have given you a third option? Mm -hmm. That instead of sitting back, that actually the gospel is propelling us to move? What does the gospel have to say about authority and the way that it's actually lived out? What does the gospel have to say about, about, about uh, submitting to authority? What does the gospel have to say about these things? Because the gospel has something to say about that because it affects lives. It affects souls. COVID-19. How can the church move around and we be callous and we not care how it affects people when over 200,000 people have died from this very thing. Where is our compassion church? Is there no room for the gospel to, to move it, into a place uh, where people are sick, where people are dying, where people are losing hope? We talk so much about, oh, where's the church? There should be healing. There should be healing. There should be healing. One thing to understand. Every miracle that Jesus did, he did not do for miracle's sake, but he did it for salvation's sake. Yes, yes, yes. And so if we're not moving in power, don't you think it may be because the gospel is absent from the way we move? Because the gospel requires us to move? And in those examples that I gave, as it pertains to so social injustice or, or, or police reform or COVID-19, it all is all affecting lives. There are people who are losing their lives daily over these different things. 
How are we not grieved when the breath of God leaves a jar of clay? How are we not grieved when people are losing their lives? We have enough to, to move for, for the lives of those who are dressed in blue, and we should. It is a dangerous job. People are putting their lives on the line. We are to care. Our hearts should be grieved when a police officer is killed. Our hearts should be grieved when a black man is killed. Our hearts should be grieved when a young kid is killed. Our hearts should be grieved when a woman is killed. Regardless of who they are, what they were doing, why they were there, those things do not matter as they do not add value or take away value from the breathe, from the soul from that from that living person yeah. that person that Jesus blew his breath in church how do we look and see that people are losing their lives physically and spiritually and say that we are going to stand back and we are not going to move mm. let's look at the election church we should also be in these in these avenues and not on the tip of election is abortion versus gay rights how dare we limit it to those two things? Are we serious? Hmm. Are we serious? We're putting way too much emphasis on these laws. As Christians, we should understand laws do not have any effects on the hearts of man. If laws could affect the heart of man, we wouldn't need Jesus. Right. We wouldn't need Jesus if that was the case. So what? Whatever that law may be, we may feel strongly about it and we may vote certain ways about it, but we cannot turn the election to be about those two things and do things alone. Abortion used to be illegal, guys. It used to be illegal. Ask yourself, why is it now legal? What happened? Is it because while it was illegal that no one was doing it? Why do we think that once these laws change that all of a sudden the hearts of people will change? We let, let's stop and think about it. So now if we understand, if we're talking about hearts being changed, if you're talking about things you want to see, well, guess what? That comes with the gospel. Mm -hmm. But if we are not trying to penetrate these issues, these societies, these communities with the love of God, with, with God himself, with the power of God, what change do we think is actually going to come forth? Mm -hmm. And all of this happens from living a life of love. Especially as we look into this election. Do you care enough who's in office as you know it affects your neighbor? It affects your city. It affects your county. It affects your state. It affects the country. All of that meaning it affects souls. Yeah. Yeah. So Jesus himself put himself in the middle of the mess. In the middle of the mess. Yet church, we're at a place where we don't want to get our hands dirty. From the creation of man, God was getting his hands dirty. From the very beginning, as he got involved with man, his hands were dirty. As he molded man out of, the, out of dirt, his hands were dirty. As he came on earth and had nails through his hands and feet, his hands got dirty. How dare we sit back and want pristine and clean hands when we don't want to infiltrate, when we don't want to penetrate, when we don't want to go in and be a part of what's going on in the community. There are people in your community who have been suffering for years. Are you even aware? There are people you are in conversation with week after week. Are you even aware of what they are going through? Are you moved with any compassion? When God is telling you, go talk to that person, do you move? When God is telling you to pray for that person, do you move? When that thought comes in the head, I should probably treat this person to lunch, do you move? When God is giving you all these avenues to show his love to people, do we move? Are we living for Christ's sake? Are we thinking for salvation's sake? Is that where we are? Because that's where Christ was. Wow, that's so good. Which allowed him to love people in his everyday life. Sharing the gospel is not, hi, do you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior? While that may be one part of it, that's not what it fully is. And we need to go back and read in the Bible and see how Jesus lived his life. The conversations that Jesus had. How Jesus was moved by compassion. And understand this is what he is calling us to do. The Father sent him and he sends us. Yeah. To be that light. To bring forth love. To bring forth compassion. And that comes from us living for Christ's sake. God, thank you so much for your love. Thank you so much for your grace. 
I thank you that you are not a God who loves in word, but one who loves in deed. I thank you that you came down to show us exactly what we should do. And not just that, but you empowered us to do it. Because you gave the church power. You breathed your Holy Spirit. You are not sending us out there alone. But you come with us. And God, I pray that we will no longer keep you in our back pockets. I pray, God, that we will no longer pick what time we should be, we should be executing or, or expressing your love, God. But I pray that we may express it in our everyday life. Open up our eyes to see, God, where you want to move, how you want to move, and allow us to do that. Give us the grace, God, the boldness, the love, God, to love our neighbors, to love our brothers, God, to affect change. Because if we will live out this life of love, change will come, transformation will come. Salvation will come. God, as you have already came and you have already given us salvation, let us move in boldness that we may offer it in the full beauty that it is, God. For the holy, precious name we pray. Amen.